It's a beautiful day to be out in the garden. You're watching A Walk in the Garden on Norfolk Community Cable Television. I'm Liz Davey, and this show is filmed about every two weeks in my garden here in Norfolk. We discuss what we can do in the garden, uh, what's growing in the garden, and then we go in and we do a little cooking and show how to use some of those things in meals that you prepare. I'm starting out in the herb garden, and the herbs are probably at their best right now. We've had sufficient rain. Uh, I've gotten the herb garden all mulched. In case it does dry out later, that will help keep it going a little longer. Uh, I've put out my herb labels. Each of the herbs is labeled with its name. I don't label all of the plants in my garden, just the herb garden, so that I know what they are and other people know what they are as well. I also put out a bee scap, and this is a, uh, an old-fashioned home for bees, although I don't expect to have any bees in it. They used to keep bees in it uh, back in the colonial days. It just adds a little touch to the herb garden, as does my old-fashioned timekeeper up on the shelf, and uh, it does tell time. Actually, the sun hits the gnomon, and you can see on the dial what time it is. So it really does work, though it's probably the most old-fashioned clock there is. Everything's in bloom, and some of the things have started to go by. The sorrel is still putting up shoots, which we can uh, cut off. And there's also some shoots on the sage, and I'll cut those off. They're gone now, just to neaten things up a little bit. I have some cilantro here, which is ready to go to seed. It's blooming. I like the white flowers. And I'm going to let that go to seed, as well as the chives, because they will seed and produce new plants. Uh, if you like new plants to form, in other words, a volunteer, it's often called, uh, to seed new plants, then leave your flowers on and let them go to seed before you cut off the old blooms. This is an old-fashioned rose. It's an apothecary rose, uh, very fragrant, and uh, really a lovely rose. It only blooms once. The old roses, many of them only bloom once during the year. I can prune that after it's finished blooming, but I will deadhead it by cutting off the blooms right now as I do with all the roses. Just remove any blooms that have already passed by. It neatens it up and it helps the bush regenerate. We have a few over here. It only blooms once, but uh, when it does, it's a glorious sight and the fragrance is really wonderful. One of the things you can do with rose petals, those of you who have seen earlier episodes, saw me candy violets for use on desserts. You can do the same with rose petals. And fra fragrant ones are definitely edible. You can uh, use them in a variety of things. Tea sandwiches can be made with uh, some cream cheese and roses. They can be used as a garnish. And you can also candy the petals by removing the petals and brushing them with uh, egg white and sprinkling them with fine sugar. They will keep in the freezer for at least a year and then can be used as decoration on cupcakes or cookies or even a cake. And they uh, are quite a conversation piece. I'm noticing a couple beetles on these. Uh, those I will just squash and remove as we go along. I don't like to use a lot of pesticides. And on some of the older roses, the Rugosa roses, actually some of the rose sprays will do damage to the foliage. So you don't want to use any sprays on rugosa roses. This is not a rugosa rose. It's just an old fashioned one. And it only gets about this tall. I'll prune it back. And uh, we have the blooms to enjoy once a year. The other things that we can pick now would include all of the thymes, uh, lemon balm, lime balm, uh, parsley, uh, rosemary, tarragon, oregano. The oregano right now is probably perfect for drying. So you would just pick off your stems. You want to pick the herbs for drying right before they bloom. That's when they have their most oils and best flavor. So the tarragon and the oregano are both ready for picking for drying. 
And I've already picked some of this to dry in the house and I'll pick more before I'm finished. Uh, once it gets a little older and blooms, it isn't quite as uh, aromatic and doesn't dry quite as well. So now's the time to pick it and do some drying. We still have a sage in flower. The herb garden doesn't have many flowers. This is another old rose. It is already finished blooming. And again, we'll take off the old bloom. Right now, picking and using the herbs and keeping the herb patch weeded isn't too big of a chore. And we're gonna move on to the perennial garden. Uh, not too much to do in here except just enjoy the herbs. So let's move over to the perennial gardens. Thanks to all the rain we've had lately, I still have a lot of work to do in the perennial garden. I have a mountain of mulch in the driveway that needs to be used, and it's time to do some deadheading and removal of bulb foliage. It, once the bulb foliage has browned, you need to leave it until it's turned brown, but once it has, then you can go ahead and, and remove it, and that's a good time if you haven't done it before, to add the mulch. And I'll be adding mulch in this garden probably for the next couple of weeks as I pull the weeds and pull out the uh, drying foliage from the bulbs that were in here. It gives a nice edging and it's also going to help a great deal if we do get a drought later on. I also need to do some deadheading here Deadheading is removing spent blooms. This is a salvia, and once the blooms have gone, if you just cut off the bloom spike, you will see underneath it two little leaves, and a new bloom spike will form, as long as you keep it deadheaded. And if you look at it carefully, you can determine how it's growing and where those secondary bloom spikes will come. So. One of the things I try to do almost every day is come out and do a little deadheading, getting rid of those extra stalks where nothing is blooming right now and has finished. That will ensure that we get a second flush of bloom from this plant. The daylilies are starting to form buds. And again, I have some plants behind them that need to be, they've finished. So we're going to just deadhead those. It keeps the garden neat, keeps the things from flopping. This is a, a plant that just forms a nice little ferny foliage, as do, do many. I like to vary the foliage color in the garden. Just adds a little interest when things aren't in bloom. Perennials generally bloom just once. Uh, some of them you can coax another set of blooms by doing things like deadheading them, but for the most part they bloom once a season. Annuals will continually bloom throughout the season, again, if you remember to deadhead them. The lilies are blooming right now, and I do have some nice lilies. Uh, I'm noticing that I must have missed a few of the lovely lily beetles when I went through earlier on, and some of them hatched. And if you see black sticky blobs on the leaves, you know that you missed them, and you also will see the leaves being eaten. And that means that the lily beetle larvae are at work, and they're what's most destructive. The little beetles themselves eat a little, but they don't eat a lot. And if you see any of the black areas, you want to be sure to squash that larva that's inside, unfortunately, its own excrement to keep your foliage. They can defoliate a plant rather quickly if you have very many of them. Uh, I wear gloves, and I suggest you do the same if you're going to squash them. You could also put them into a can of soapy water, but I just like to squash them. Well, moving along, I still have some of the bulb foliage back here. And you'll notice I've got daylilies in front of it. Daylilies and 
daffodils make a very good combination because as the daylily comes up and starts to bloom, it's about the time that the uh, bulb foliage behind it is starting to go. And some of this is ready to be pulled out, but it isn't completely ready. You want the foliage to be completely brown before you pull it out of the ground. This plant is Phlomis, P-H-L-O-M-I-S. It was in bud when we were here last time, and the uh, Nectoscordum was blooming. The Nectoscordum has got a few blooms left, but not many. That'll be deadheaded soon. But the Phlomis will continue to bloom. It's an interesting plant in that it blooms in layers, and it's kind of a conversation piece. Other things are budded, the Echinacea, Platycodon behind it, and those will take over. I try to plant a succession of bloom knowing that they only bloom once. This is uh, Penstemon Huskers Red. Uh, the blooms themselves are not red, they're white, but the stalks are red, and that's where it gets its name. Coral bells are still blooming. They've been blooming now for over a month, and they are nice to have in the garden. They do bloom a little bit longer. This was in bloom two weeks ago. This is a Veronica, Crater Lake Blue. It's done for the season. Uh, we won't get any more blooms from that one. The peonies have also finished, and I'll let these uh, seed heads stay on the peonies a little while longer. I like to dry these and then spray them usually gold, and they look really nice in fall and holiday decorations, or you can just leave them brown for that matter. And they look nice. The foliage of the peony will actually die down this summer, and it will be gone, so I'll need to put something in to fill the spot a little later on. Foxgloves are now in bloom, and I have a variety of them here and there. They are a biennial, meaning they bloom one year and then they, and set seed, and then the following year foliage will grow, and then a bloom will happen the second year. So I want to make sure that I leave these to self-seed. I have others that have self-seeded throughout the garden. One in back, it's a little darker pink, was a self-seed from two years ago. So again, this is a pretty light pink one, and we want to make sure it continues. More lilies ready to go. Uh, they're a little lighter variety. Lilies come in two varieties, the Asiatic and the Oriental. The Orientals bloom lighter. Actually, there are more varieties than that, but for most gardeners, the two are the most popular ones. Year before last, we started butterfly weed seeds in milk jugs in our winter seeding. And these are the results of that project. Uh, we put out the seedlings last fall when the plants were just fairly tiny. And this year they came up and are going full strength. Hopefully they will uh, bring some monarch butterflies to the garden. They are one of the preferred foods, the butterfly weed and milkweed. It's the same family as milkweed, but it's a little bit showier. Uh, monarchs are in decline for a variety of reasons, and I'm trying to do what I can to make the butterflies happy here. That includes minimal use of pesticides. In fact, I use very few pesticides of any sort, and any that I do use are organic certified. Anything that has what is called a neonicotinoid in it is very dangerous for any of the pollinators, butterflies, bees, any of them, and is banned in other countries. They still allow it here in this country, but I really don't suggest using it in your garden because it is very damaging to some of the things that you'd really like to see in your garden. This is a knockout rose, and again, it's in full bloom. These will bloom for a long season. They have a repeat bloom rather than the single bloom of the old rose. They're a more modern rose. And again, I deadhead it. You don't have to deadhead the knockout rose unless you want to. And I usually do just, just to keep it looking neat. Roses put out a first flush of bloom, usually in June. And this one's right on time. And then they take a little rest and do a second flush of bloom if they're re-blooming roses. 
any of the roses will, after they've finished blooming, be deadheaded and then get a second dose of rose fertilizer. That will help them put on that second flush of bloom. They also need about five gallons of water per week. So I'll have to be sure to come out here with my watering can if we don't get sufficient rain. I've added a couple annuals in here because these, this bob foliage will be disappearing soon and I'll probably add a few more annuals at that time or some other things. Some plants are prone to mildew and one of the things you can use to help prevent mildew on the flowers, and phlox would be one of those flowers, is to use a milk and water, half and half solution. And this is just plain milk and water from the tap. And spray it on the foliage. And this is uh, reportedly as effective as some of the commercial sprays. And this is a nice blue phlox, which will bloom a little later on. I'm getting a little milk on it now. You can see the milk, but that's exactly what we want. This is the gas plant that we planted earlier. It's a new one for me, and it is blooming. It was also attracting hummingbirds, which I really enjoyed. I'll also use the uh, milk and water combination on other things that would mildew. That would be uh, bee balm. Uh, that is one that tends to get mildew pretty badly. Mildew would be that white coating that forms on the leaves. It also forms on lilacs sometimes. If the humidity is high and there's not much of a breeze, you can look forward to mildew. It also will be on squash leaves. So the milk and water is a really safe thing you can use on the leaves of squash to prevent the mildew and to control it. If you see, start to see mildew, is the time to use it. So just take, keep looking at the plants and if you see a little white starting to form, that's the time to get out the milk and water or a commercial product that is safe, uh, organic product. Moving over here, we're also going to deadhead the peonies that have bloomed. They're almost finished. We still have a few white ones up by the fence, but I cut those back to take off the old blooms which are kind of sad looking at this point. And I really don't want them to go to seed. This will give the bush a little more strength going into the, the next season. I have a number of things that have self-seeded, uh, including larkspur. I planted the larkspur in the garden a couple years ago, and it's been coming up here and there ever since. I transplanted some over here two years ago and now it seeds itself each year and I have larkspur coming up here and there. When you do have things that self-seed, uh, the Nicotiana also does that as well as the foxgloves. You need to thin it out a little bit. Sometimes you'll get five or six plants all in the same area. So you do need to thin out the plants a little bit to keep a good spot and you know some of them you'll just have to get out of the way because they don't uh, belong where they are in the middle of another plant. You can also share some of them with friends and it's nice to have things that just come up every year. They're surprises because you never know where they will come up. This is a pineapple lily and I have two pots of pineapple lilies and this is a spot that's left from removing bulb foliage. So I'll be putting some potted things in here. Those were bulbs that uh, I left inside the house in a cool bedroom over the winter. They died back. I didn't water them, didn't do a thing. Until about a month ago, I brought them into the house, down into the sunroom, and started watering them. I'll keep them watered, and we're going to have some flowers on this. And it adds, fills in a space that's left over from the bulb foliage. Some people don't like to plant bulbs because they have spaces. I really enjoy it because then I can plug other things in to add the color that's needed. It's the last opportunity about now to pinch back chrysanthemums. So if we just take about the quarter to half an inch out of the top of the chrysanthemum and 
it will then spread and form two stalks where there was just one. And this will give you more blooms and it also keeps the plant a little shorter. You can do it until July 4th. These daisies are finished. These are gonna be cut way back, all the way to the, to the base. So as you can see, there's plenty to be done here and also the mulching to be done as quickly as I can get it done, pending the, some good weather, like today. Have another poppy. Again, I'll uh, leave those for a little while till they start to dry, then cut them down and bring them into the garden shed so they can ripen and dry and be used later in other decorations. Now let's go over to the vegetable garden and see what's happening there. Our garlic is putting up garlic scapes. If these were left to mature, they would form a seed head and a flower. What I want is the root to harvest. So these are going to get cut off. And we can use those. They have a garlic flavor. We cut off this part of the seed head at the end, and then we chop it up and you can use it. Some people pickle them. You can certainly smell that they have a garlicky flavor and they can be used for garlic until you have your garlic, which will come in about a month and a half when the leaves die down. I'm also able to pick scallions from this side of the garden so we can use those as well. And the peas have started. I have three varieties of peas in here. I have snow peas, snap peas, and shell peas. And the snow peas are ready to go. And you just snap them off the bush, and then you'll take the ends off. And we have quite a few. They need to be picked about every other day because you don't want in those, um, snow peas, you don't want the peas to form. You can see little teeny peas inside, but you don't want large peas to form in these because they're eaten in uh, stir fries and they can even be eaten raw uh, in salads. So you don't want big peas because if they form on the snow peas, the pods get quite tough and the peas really aren't that good. For shell peas, I'll wait until the other ones down at the other end of the row are ready, and then we shell those out. We throw away the outside and eat the inside. Now I'm gonna move up this way. Strawberries are ripe too. June is strawberry month. And I have my strawberries under a net to help with the chipmunk problem. And in order to pick them, I move the rocks off and pull the net back. And then I can get at my berries underneath and go through and fill my boxes with the nice red ripe berries. If you do have a really bad chipmunk problem, let's see. You may want to pick your berries slightly on the green side and let them ripen in the house. The chipmunks seem to know when the berries are just fully ripe and dark red, but they'll leave you some that are not quite ripe. So if they have just turned color, you'll be able to pick uh, some that are a little less ripe and bring them in the house. This year has been a great year for uh, the strawberries. I've been able to get about two quarts, two to three quarts every other day for the last week. This is a variety of strawberries that is June blooming and June fruiting. It is not ever bearing. You can get ever bearing strawberries that will give you a little for a longer period of time. I kind of like the June bearing ones uh, that have all their fruit. You have enough to make some jam or do a little freezing or make a lot of shortcake. 
uh, all in June, and then they're finished for the season. When I'm finished, I'm sure to put the netting back over it. And this is just nylon dress netting that you can get at a fabric store. Other nets I've found have larger holes and they allow the birds to peck right through it. And the birds only take one or two bites out of the strawberry, but it ruins it for human consumption. I'm gonna be watering my tomatoes. And I'll add some fertilizer. I'm using a uh, fish fertilizer, fish and seaweed fertilizer. I learned the hard way that you do not use this on house plants because it smells really bad. And it's not something you want in the house. It's fine outside. You only need about a tablespoon per gallon. And this is a two gallon watering can. So I'll just put two tablespoons in. and slowly give each of my tomatoes a good soaking with it. I'll do that about every two weeks. You have to go slow because I've got these in the uh, black plastic around them. The black plastic absorbs heat and tomatoes love heat. So we'll just keep going along and doing the whole row. And I'll do the eggplants and peppers with the same solution. Again, about every two weeks. And anything else that I think needs a little boost. The squash is coming up. I have other seeds that are not yet germinated. We have some tiny herbs here and there. But uh, I do have some squash that's up and there's more to come up. And I'm gonna put aluminum foil around it. I often have trouble with squash vine borers. And I'm just going to put around each one a border of aluminum foil. It seems to confuse them. It does uh, also generate some reflection and uh, it may help, seems to help with insects around squash. It shouldn't be long before the squash leaves completely cover the foil so you won't be seeing it. I just weight it down with rocks. And we have plenty of those in New England, so you shouldn't be without a ready supply. And I'll do that with each of the hills where the plants are growing. Now I wanna go back to where I have some flowers planted along the edge. And last uh, winter, I had a number of amaryllis bulbs that bloomed. And these I've kept inside and kept watered, but now it's time to bring them out for summer vacation. So I'm gonna just dig holes along the fence here. And I'll plant each one. Some of these have a few rocks in the bottom, but that's all right. I'll keep these watered and fertilized all summer. And then come fall, I'll pot them up again. I'll let the foliage die back. And after Christmas sometime, I'll start to water them again. And we should have amaryllis that blooms in January or February, just about the time you need a little color in the house. But these will live out here this summer and hopefully put on some good roots and uh, get ready to bloom again next winter. They last for several years. Once the bulbs get too small, I just discard them in the compost. Now let's head back into the shade. Shade is kind of refreshing on a day like this. I've put in a few pots in the shade garden. Uh, we have a lot of plants in here. Nothing really flowers much in the 
shade in the summer. It's nice and cool down here. Nice place to sit uh, and cool off, but it's nice to have a little color too. So I've repotted some of the coleus that I got. Uh, I got a six pack of it, used some in my planters, and then just put two individual plants in separate pots. This gives some colorful foliage for the area, a little more colorful. And then I had begonia bulbs, again, that I kept in that cool bedroom over the winter, and I planted those, and they came up really well inside, and so I put them into a big pot, and they are going to bloom with white flowers a little later, we hope. Uh, usually they do pretty well in this location. All of these plants are very prone to being damaged by slugs, especially if the weather's wet. So I will want to make sure that I use some of the slug magic. This is that iron oxide product. It's not harmful to pets or other things, but it is to slugs if they ingest it. The other thing you could do is use copper banding around uh, a set of plants if you want to keep the slugs out. Evidently, slugs have kind of an electric charge on their slimy little bodies, and uh, the iron causes a problem with them. And copper, if they contact copper, it kills them. So a uh, copper border works well, too, with slugs. I don't like to use the baits that are toxic. Uh, that was all they had until they realized this iron product was effective. But it really makes a difference in your potted plants that you bring out, your house plants, if you use it around on them and around them. I'm also going to plant some of the impatiens that I grew from seed. This one's got buds on it. And again, slugs love impatiens. And I plant very few of them in the ground. I put most of them into the planters that are around the pond and here and there in the shade garden, again, to add some color. But I'll make an exception with several in some of the spots that could use a little extra color. And we'll just pop this guy in. And I will be mulching this garden as well with the wood chips, which helps. They don't particularly like to walk on wood chips either. But I will use the slug product all around it. They're most interested in plants that have very tender foliage. Once the hostas achieve a large size, they aren't able to do as much damage, especially with some of the thicker leaved hosta. And they don't seem to bother the uh, helibores much at all. So you just need it initially. And then we'll water that in well. This year we've had the luxury of not having to do too much watering, only in sunny spots that, or spots that are under eaves that don't get sufficient rainfall so far. But I suspect that that will change as we get into August and probably September. Now I'm going back towards the pond. Down at the pond, we still haven't gotten any fish. Uh, we've been twice to the pet store to get fish. The first time they did not have the size that we wanted to get, which is small. They grow up. And the second time we went, the fish were sick and we really didn't want to put sick fish in our pond. So we're still waiting. And hopefully by the next time I do a show, we will have eight or 10 nice new fish in the pond. I do have a few plants. A few of my plants, my elephant ears, I don't think survived the winter. They usually do, but this year, I think they just didn't make it. I'm gonna have to get new ones next year, or maybe even bite the bullet and go buy some that are already in flower. I use uh, plant food that's uh, designed for aquatic plants. And basically you just push it in and about once a month, you just push it into the soil around the plant. Cover it up and then it's finished. And I'll do the same with the plants on the other side of the pond a little later on. 
I do need to do some trimming around the pond so that I can get to the plants and some of the other plants show up a little better. With all this rain, the shrubs have also grown pretty well. The new plants that I put in this fall are doing really well, or this spring, and uh, I've always wanted to have some of both of them. So we have a rogersia down here and a large-leafed Bernera. This uh, should have larger leaves. This is a baby one, but as it grows up, its leaves supposedly get about a foot wide. This one should like a damp spot, and this spot is rather damp, and it gets about part sun, which is just what the label said it needed. So we'll hope, be hopeful that it is going to work well. This is an ornamental grass, northern sea oats. It's one of the few grasses that will grow in shade besides uh, the carex, which I also have the green and white striped grasses. But the northern sea oats will put on a seed pod that's rather decorative, and it's one of the few. The other plant over here is called a turtle head, and it's a native plant. It will have white blooms later on uh, in the fall. So we're adding a little here and there, and I've also got an astilbe in here and some ferns, and plenty of hosta, which brings up the deer spray again. You have to keep at it. Uh, one spray is not enough. Unfortunately, I come out after every heavy rain and use my pump sprayer and just give uh, my hosta a good coating. It's non-toxic, but the deer don't like it, and it helps them to avoid my yard as they go on their way. There's plenty for them to eat out in the field behind me, so I don't feel like I'm depriving them of their dinner. And I like to see the hosta in bloom. And I'll go throughout the yard and other shrubs that they uh, might find delectable. I will also give a coating of the deer spray. I keep repeating it simply because you have to keep repeating it or repeating the spraying or you will lose the hosta even later on in the season. Uh, the slugs don't bother it as much later, but the deer will eat it at any time that your spray program lags a bit if they're in the area. And I know we have deer. We actually have uh, out here a mother with a very small fawn uh, in the area, which, and I hope to see her. I haven't seen her, but others have. So perhaps I will soon. Now I think it's time to go inside and use some of the things that we picked in the garden today. I'll see you inside. Summer cooking is always the best because you get to use some fresh things from the garden. And today is no exception. We're going to start out by making something that isn't from the garden, but it goes with something that is. We're going to make some shortcakes to go with strawberry shortcake. And rather than just plain biscuits, these are special ones. And I'm going to start with two cups of flour, and then I'll add a tablespoon of baking powder. Let's make sure it all, all gets out. About a teaspoon of salt, and a tablespoon of sugar. Those are the dry ingredients. Then I'm going, I've cut up one and a quarter half sticks of butter and it's cold it's been in the refrigerator and I'm going to use the mixer to mix it up until it makes uh, crumbs the size of peas on a low speed it'll take a few minutes on the low speed If the butter were uh, warm, it would mix right in and you wouldn't get the flakiness that we want. You could probably do this with two knives as well, but using the mixer is easier for me, so. 
That's what I'm gonna do. There, I think it's about ready. Now I'm going to break two eggs into a half a cup of heavy cream. As you can see, there's are our rich biscuits. And I'll mix those with the fork. I'm going to slowly add this with the mixer running. Mix it just until everything is well mixed. It's going to be soft and a little bit sticky. Let's get it all off of there. I'm going to move my mixer out of the way, a little bit more off. I'll spread out my uh, rolling canvas. And add some flour. You could also use a uh, cutting board. Again, you'll want a good coating of flour because it is a reasonably sticky dough. I'll turn it out. And we just mixed it until things were mostly mixed. It's still pretty rough. That's what makes for tender biscuits. Now I'll work it together in the flour and knead it a few times. Make sure everything's mixed. Fold it over and press it down again. Just two or three times. The less you work a uh, biscuit dough, the more tender your biscuits will be. And I'm going to use a fairly good sized cutter for these and I have it oh maybe a quarter of an inch to a half inch thick. And I'll put those right on a parchment lined baking sheet. You can re-roll the dough by stacking it up. They won't necessarily be as pretty when they're finished, but they'll be just as tasty. So pat that out. And we can get maybe three or four more. By uh, layering it this way rather than just crumpling it into a ball, you will uh, not have them get as tough. And I guess we can get one more.
and one rough piece just as a test. Now these will go into a 400 degree oven. Oops, almost forgot. You want to have your oven preheated and I'm uh, using an egg that's been mixed with two tablespoons of water to brush the tops. And since they're for dessert, we'll sprinkle them with a little sugar on top, too. Neither the egg nor the sugar is essential, but it is nice. And then into the middle of a 400 degree oven, for about 25 minutes. Now the next thing I want to do while we're waiting for our shortcakes to come out of the oven is to make a salad. And my base for the salad will be arugula, which uh, is fast going to seed in the garden because it's gotten hotter. And this is more of a cool weather crop, though it will grow all season if you keep it picked. Uh, but it tends to go to seed rather quickly. We like arugula. It has a spicy flavor. Uh, it stands up to a more robust dressing. And that's what we're going to put together some things to go with it. And I'm going to start with a heaping half cup of chickpeas. And about a tablespoon of those garlic scapes. These have been cut into little circles. You want tiny pieces because it is fairly pungent. You could also use garlic, a garlic clove that's been minced. I'm also putting in a couple scallions that have been sliced and one tomato that's been diced. And I'm gonna kind of mix those around and then I'll add some dressing. And I'm going to add two tablespoons of olive oil. And a tablespoon of vinegar. And I'm using sherry vinegar. You could use balsamic, you could use wine vinegar. Even cider vinegar would work. But you need uh, a vinegar or some aspect of that. And then I've chopped up some of the dill and I'll add probably a tablespoon of dill. This is something that you can just put together with what you have and use what vegetables you have too and what vinegar and oil. And I'll mix this. Now ideally I would let this mixture marinate in the refrigerator for several hours. But in the interest of our time, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to add right now some feta cheese. It's been crumbled. You could also use a blue cheese and some toasted walnuts. And I'm going to get out my salad utensils. And after we mix this, this makes a fairly hearty salad. And again, your choice of ingredients. If you don't like cheese, you can leave that out. If you can't have nuts, you can leave those out. And I'm going to add those to the arugula and toss it together.
Make sure some of the dressing coats all of the leaves. That's our arugula salad. This would be good served with barbecue, uh, barbecue chicken breast or uh, cold cut up chicken or perhaps some of the chicken, rotisserie chicken uh, that is left over. You could slice that up with it and have it as a side dish and that makes a pretty complete dinner, especially when you consider the dessert we're going to have. Then we're going to make strawberry shortcake and I have one of the shortcakes here. Let's see if I can put that over out of the way. And I'm going to add a little cream. This is uh, heavy cream that's been whipped with a little sugar and a little vanilla. And the strawberries have also had a little bit of sugar sprinkled on them, which helps the juices to form. And we'll put those on the... And we've missed a piece of the stem. And maybe a few more strawberries. And a nice dollop of cream on top. And this is summer at its best. And I'll put a whole berry on top of that. And we have a strawberry shortcake for dessert. I'll leave the strawberries here in case we want a few more on there. And then we're going to finish it off with a nice glass of iced tea. Always refreshing on a warm day. And remember we have herbs, so we can put a nice piece of mint in the iced tea. And maybe put some extra shortcake out too in case anybody would like a second helping. So there you have it, our summer meal for a nice beautiful summer day in the garden. I have extra mint that I keep in the kitchen and I also have a plate here where I'm drying some of the herbs that are at their peak. The oregano is on the bottom and the dill is on the top. A lot of this dill has already dried. I just keep this whole thing in the dining room on a sideboard and let the herbs dry naturally. You could also hang them, which I also do, uh, by putting together packets with a rubber band. We'll do that with some of the others. We did it with the lovage earlier in the season, and that's already been dried and put away. So this is one way to dry herbs, just on plates, and if you have a plate stand, it works quite well so you can get the air to circulate around them. Thank you for joining me today for a walk in the garden. I'm Liz Davey, and you've been watching Norfolk Community Cable Television. We'll see you next time. Happy gardening. Mm -hmm.